Hey guys, I'm back and I've got a video for you today on how to take the perfect shot of the Milky Way. Now let's get started. Now we've all seen these shots and they are gorgeous, especially if you have an interesting foreground object. But what a lot of people don't realize is they're not really that hard to take. You're talking about a fixed tripod, a camera capable of manual exposure, and a good fast wide lens. That's all you really need to take this kind of shot. Now let's talk about the season because there actually is a season for Milky Way photography and that typically runs from late June through late August. And the reason for this is that is the time of the year when you have the galactic core visible above the horizon at night during normal nighttime hours, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, and you're able just to get that shot. Other times of the year, guys, like in the winter time when I like, I like to go camping, my friends always say, hey Derek, let's take a Milky Way shot. And I say, guys, you're not gonna see it because in the winter time, you see the really faint, um, wispy part of the Milky Way. It's not really colorful, not very impactful. Whenever you see those like national park pictures with the Milky Way just like shooting up out of the mountains, that was taken in the summertime, guys. So make sure you keep that in mind. All right, guys, so let's talk equipment. You don't need a top spec Nikon D850 or Canon 5D Mark IV for this. It does help, especially if you're going to be printing a shot, but really the lens is going to make more of an impact than the camera body for most of this kind of shooting. Now, so yeah, I mean, if you have a camera, have a camera that's capable of manual exposure because you'll be setting the shutter speed and aperture manually. You wanna set like a countdown timer, a 10 second timer, a two second timer just anything to mitigate the uh, vibration of hitting the button. You don't want that. Um, a good solid tripod. You don't need to go crazy here, but especially if you're taking shots outside at night, which you're going to be doing, and if it's windy, you don't want the wind to be shifting your shot around and giving you, um, you know, star trails instead of a static shot. And it does help to have an app on your smartphone, something like Sky Guide or Star Watcher, there's a couple different ones, but what I like about Sky Guy is it's so simple, and this is an iPhone here. It's I think it's $199 or so, but it's money well spent. It's a very slick app. You can zoom in, you can set a different time, you can you can go to a particular date and time and see where that Milky Way is going to be on the horizon, and you can use this to kind of uh, validate what I was saying earlier about there being a season for Milky Way photography. Like right now, this is uh, current conditions. It is September 6th at 7.09 p.m. And yeah, the Milky Way is up over here to the south. But, you know, of course it's daylight. But later on, let's say 12.21 a.m. past midnight, it's going to be over here. So if I didn't live in a heinously light polluted area, I might be able to see it. So yeah, an app can help. It's not necessary, but especially if you're talking about planning a trip or planning a shot, it's great to be able to see exactly where that Milky Way is going to be with respect to your direction and the horizon at any given date and time. So I definitely recommend getting an app. So I've talked about the camera. Let's talk about lenses. Now, the name of the game is fast and wide. Fast meaning a low F number like f2, f1.8, f1.4 if you have it, or 1.2. I mean, the lower that number, the more light that lens is going to let in and the lower you can set your ISO. So lower f number, lower ISO, less noise. Higher f number, higher ISO, more noise, but same brightness. There's an equivalence there, but if you want less noise, you want to actually print a shot that doesn't look like garbage, you want the lowest f number possible. Now a wide lens, depending on the camera you have, if you have full frame, 24 millimeters is great, 14 is great too, maybe even a little bit too wide. I mean, um, a great lens if you have full frame is a 24 millimeter f1.4. Yeah, you can spend big bucks on a Canon uh, 24 millimeter L lens or an Nikon 24, but for this kind of photography, just static night shots, Look at the Samyang, look at the Rokinon 24mm 1.4. They're manual focus, but they're like 400 bucks, um, give or take. And they'll give you good performance for this type of photography. And 1.4 at 24mm is great. If you shoot a crop camera like a Nikon um, D7500 or a 
Canon ADD or something like that. You probably want to stay around, you know, 14 to 18. Uh, Fujifilm makes an awesome 16 millimeter f1.4 lens. That would be just killer for this type of photography. And if you shoot micro four thirds, you want to kind of stay around maybe 10 to 12. Panasonic makes a 12 millimeter f1.4. It's rather expensive, but there are some other options. Panasonic makes a 15 millimeter f1.7. So yeah, fast and wide. Now there is some math involved. It's very basic math, but there's a little bit of math involved in terms of getting your field of view and getting pinpoint stars instead of star trails because anybody who's taken a shot at night knows you take a long enough shot, those stars are gonna move and instead of dots, you're gonna get streaking. Now, sometimes you can use this to a cool effect like this shot, but for a shot of the Milky Way, you do not want this. You do not want a smeared mess of the Milky Way moving across the sky. So you use what's called the rule of 500. Now, if you look at this graphic, you have 500 divided by C, which is the crop factor. For micro four thirds, it's two. For a Canon, it's 1.6. For Nikon, it's 1.5. And then if you shoot a full frame, it's one. You can just take it out. And then F, that is the focal length that is printed on your lens. That is the true non-compensated focal length. So, you know, if you have your kit lens, it's probably gonna say 18 on it, 18 to 55. So you divide out those numbers, and let's say I'm using my Panasonic 7 millimeter. The lens I'm using on here now is a 7 to 14. Let's say I'm shooting that at seven millimeters. So that gives me 500 divided by two times seven, which is 500 divided by 14 which is 36 seconds. Now let's take a look at this shot I took in Idaho. Now this was at ISO 6400, 36 seconds at F4. Now you're probably looking at it thinking, well that's a nice shot, but man is that noisy. Well, that's your 6400 and that's because this lens does not open any wider than F4. So if I had that Leica uh, 12 millimeter F1.4, I would be letting in eight times as much light. So you could use a much, much lower ISO. Wouldn't be as wide, couldn't use as long of a shot, but it would overall give me a much better looking exposure than this. But that's also about a $1,200 lens. So yeah, looking at this rule of 500, this basically means that the wider focal length you have, the wider lens you're using, the longer exposure you can get away with without having star streaking. So you wanna find, you want to find a comfortable medium there um, between lens speed and width and exposure time and ISO. It's a lot to think about, but I mean, just keep in mind fast, wide, strike a balance there. If you use like a portrait lens, like you might say, well, I have a 50 millimeter f1.8. 1.8 is nice and low. Well, yeah, you can get a, like a cropped in shot of the Milky Way, but you're not going to be able to, to shoot that much longer than like four seconds or so before it starts to streak across too much. So there's a lot of variables to keep in mind. So yeah, guys, that's it. It's really not that hard. You have your tripod, your camera, uh, set a short timer, take the shot, shoot in raw, you can manipulate it later, but go fast and wide on that lens. Peak season for Milky Way is June through August. And um, yeah, happy shooting.